Good afternoon. My, I'm sorry. Good afternoon. Oh, <laughs> thanks. My name is Sarah Heminger, and while I am not originally from Baltimore, I have spent the last 15 years of my life falling deeply in love with the people of Baltimore. And I am absolutely thrilled to introduce this panel on the impact of human capital on inequities, as well as our distinguished speakers, Dr. James Comer, uh, Dr. David Andrews, and Ms. Courtney Cass. Just to kind of start off the conversation, I thought we could take a look back into what many American cities, including Baltimore, looked like 60 years ago. So while neighborhoods and schools were uh, racially segregated, there was an enormous amount of socioeconomic diversity that exists in many neighborhoods and schools. So you might have a lawyer living down the street from a sanitation worker or living down the street from a teacher. And so if there was a single mom who couldn't get home until 9 at night to take care of her children, she could send her children down the street to maybe stay with the wife of the lawyer who was a stay-at-home mom. And so there was this an enormous amount of social capital found in the community, not just in the families, but in the community that served as a safety net for children and was very critical. And so when you look at the two things that seem to matter most when helping a child mature into a happy, healthy adult, it's one, do they have a caring adult throughout their childhood and adolescence? And two, are there high expectations? And so today our hope is that we can talk about the role of human and social capital in helping raise happy, healthy adults. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk about schools today uh, a bit and, and education and its relation to um, human capital and, and in a couple of different ways. And it's interesting when you think about our schools and our communities and the, and the role that they play uh, around human capital. One, we all know that our schools are critical in generating human capital. We depend upon our schools to educate the next population uh, to prepare us for citizenry, for employability, for being productive uh, in our communities. Uh, but we also know that our schools and our educational systems actually require human capital in order to be effective and to help stimulate growth and productivity in our neighborhood. So it's uh, a double-edged sword with education. We want education to build our human capital. We need it to generate human capital, but we also depend upon human capital in order to run our schools and our educational systems effectively. So I want to talk about both of those issues just uh, briefly. First is the creation of human capital and what that takes in our communities and how schools can be helpful. Obviously, we know that high-performing schools are able to help students uh, become educated and build a pathway towards productivity and, uh, and effective citizenship. We know that starting early is critically important. Uh, we've all heard the statistics and the research on uh, and evidence around uh, early childhood education and, and great starts. Uh, we tend to, in our schools, get a sense of um, false security. Uh, because we require children to go to school uh, and consequently we think that while they're in school they're progressing well enough uh, by you know by definition they're still going uh, we know our dropout rates though can be predicted very early uh, as early as third and fourth grade with uh, literacy scores and math scores uh, and so we need to think about the entire pipeline of strong schools to anchor our communities and build this uh, human capital that's necessary to, to move our communities forward. The second thing that our schools do, and we need to think about, especially uh, in Baltimore, is that high quality schools not only build human capital, they attract human capital. So schools, whether they be K-12 schools, high quality early childhood settings, or even higher education universities, our anchor institutions within our neighborhoods, strong schools attract 
a population to our neighborhoods uh, that are willing to live there and want to live there and want to be part of a vibrant community. It's very difficult to, to develop strong communities and a sense of community if you don't have high performing schools. So schools not only build human capital, they attract human capital and we need to think about the development of high quality, high performing schools within our, our city in order to build that human capital and to attract it. Probably more importantly though, uh, or as important I guess, is the notion that schools and educational systems require human capital in order to be effective. That is, we need highly effective adults in our schools and for that matter in our communities in after school programs and youth related programs to build human capital. We have to expend human capital and it requires a dedicated workforce. Unfortunately, we don't find uniformly dedicated and competent workforces across our schools and within our communities, especially our most struggling uh, communities that are in the highest state of socioeconomic um, disarray. We have our poorest communities attracting a population, uh, a workforce that is often unprepared to deal with the challenges of those communities. And so we have to think about what, how do we create the human capital in our schools and our educational systems, both formal and informal, in order to respond to the unique needs of these very, very challenging communities. And we need to think about it in two ways. One, we'll hear quite a bit about recruitment uh, and induction of highly talented individuals to, to work in our schools. But we also need to think about retention and the conditions that are necessary in order to retain this human capital in our most struggling uh, communities. So we know that even in, uh, from our most traditional programs, I'll use teacher preparation as an example, about 50% of those that we train in teacher preparation are gone from the profession after five years. That number is much higher uh, in our most struggling communities with our lowest performing schools. Uh, we know that retention of that human capital is critical. We also know a bit about why they leave. Uh, they leave because they feel unsupported. They leave because many times the leadership and, and organizational strategies in the school is chaotic. Uh, they leave because it's hard. Uh, they leave because they have other opportunities. Uh, but they, they leave in large numbers regardless of how they were trained or inducted into the profession. So we have to think about what are the conditions that we can create in our schools to retain the best and the brightest and to give them the types of support that's necessary. We need to think about um, our training programs is ongoing and, and our professional development is integrated with what's going on in the day-to-day -day lives of our teachers and our school leaders. Uh, we need to stop thinking about a pre-service definition of teacher preparation where we train them in the university and send them out and keep our fingers crossed uh, that good things happen. Uh, we need to be very, very closely aligned with the programs that are recruiting the best and the brightest into the profession and make sure that we're giving our professionals the kind of support that keeps them in, in the field. Uh, we need to fight for salaries and compensation that are competitive, uh, especially uh, competitive in our lower income communities uh, so that we don't see the pattern that we currently see, which are um, people coming into the profession and if they do not leave the profession, uh, they, they at least leave our, our lowest uh, performing schools and our highest need neighborhoods. And so we need to turn that pattern around. Uh, we need to think about human capital as the type of investment that we, we make in our communities so that the next generation benefits and, and grows in their own capacity to turn the, their communities around. Uh, but we also need to think about how do we keep our best and brightest in the, not just education, uh, but in all of our human services fields so that we can uh, turn the corner and build strong communities. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Courtney Cass. I'm the Executive Director of Teach for America in Baltimore. Um, so Teach for America, for those who don't know, is a national teaching and leadership core. We have been 
around for about 23 years, and we've been in Baltimore City for the last 20. And we think about human capital at pretty much every single possible level, starting with our students. So for the 85,000 students in Baltimore City Public Schools today, just six out of every 100 are on a path to go to and through college. Um, and so we spend, our, our focus is on, oops, is on turning that around. Because for us, it's obviously a, a social justice issue, but it's also a human capital and an economic issue that impacts Baltimore in a variety of ways. Um, so I often, when I think about who are the students in that 6%, I think about some of the students that I taught about 10 years ago in New York City, and I think about a young woman I met recently in Baltimore. Her name is Brianna. Uh, I met her when she was 17 years old, um, and she was a junior at Ace High School in, in Baltimore City, and she had been to 18 different schools in 17 years. She had grown up in a community where she saw drugs and violence and prostitution almost every day on the street outside her home and often inside her home. She had overcome tremendous obstacles. I met her through her work with a program called The Intersection, which works on developing student voice and leadership to create positive change in Baltimore City. And through finding her voice and developing different characteristics and working extremely hard in school, she managed to graduate from high school, get accepted into, ha accepted to Hampton College in Virginia, and she's now finishing up her first year with a 3.7 GPA. She has faced a variety of challenges along the way, and, and I've gotten to follow her, and I've seen what, um, I actually saw Paul Tuff speak this afternoon, I'm sure many of you are familiar with him, and I've seen that um, it's not just the fact that she has strong academic skills and that she was able to develop the reading and the math skills she needed to be accepted to college and to succeed in college. It's also that she has a variety of character traits like hard work and curiosity and grit and zest that have helped her stay on the right path. She also is a self-advocate. She knows how to ask for help. She's someone who, when she was at the end of her first semester, worried about how she was gonna be able to stay in college because she didn't know how to pay for it, reached out to the folks from the intersection who were able to grant her access. So at Teach for America, we think of these four quadrants, the dramatic academic gains, the character traits and mindsets, the access and the self-advocacy as the critical traits that we need to be developing in our students so that they are able to become the future human capital of Baltimore City. And we're developing those um, those traits in two ways. So it starts with our teaching core. We are um, obsessed with finding leadership from across the country, diverse leadership of all backgrounds and academic majors who we believe have the potential to lead their students as teachers to embody that kind of leadership that's gonna put them on a path to be successful no matter what they go into. Um, so we, look for a couple of things in those leaders, actually, and there are many of the same traits that I described earlier. There's this sort of beautiful parallel between the kinds of traits that our students need to embody to be successful and the kind of traits that we're selecting for in the teacher leaders we're pursuing. So they include things like zest, optimism, achievement, grit, and leadership. This year, 57 thousand people applied to Teach for America from across the country, and we selected 6,000 who commit two years to teaching in low-income public schools in rural and urban communities. About 170 of them will be coming to Baltimore City this fall. Among that 170, one thing we're really proud of is that eight of them are actually Baltimore City public school graduates. And we see a variety of um, I mean, it, it really is a diverse group. I think about a young woman who's in her, her second year who I think embodies so many of these traits. She was born in Ghana. She lived for her first 10 years um, in Ghana and went to a Ghanaian school. There were 44 students in her class and they were ranked every day based on how they were doing in school. And she was 42 out of 44. And her mom, who had not graduated from high school, marched into the school and said, you know, what's going on? Why is my, why is Naomi 42 out of 44 and what can I do? 
And the mother would go to the school every single day and quiz the teacher on what they were learning. And then every single day when Naomi would get home from school, her mother would quiz her on what had happened that day and was completely obsessed with helping Naomi get better. And Naomi really internalized this need to persevere and to work hard and to overcome. When she was 10, she moved to Newark, New Jersey. She actually has memories of being taught by Teach for America Corps members when she was growing up in Newark public schools. And then she joined Teach for America. She went to Cornell. She was a pre-med major. She planned to go on to medical school. And she said, I'm going to teach for two years because teachers were so instrumental in really changing my life path. And then after that, I'll move on and go to medical school. So this sort of gets to the second part of our mission. Um, I personally am happy to say that as Naomi finishes up her two-year commitment, she has decided to postpone medical school. She's going to be staying in Baltimore City and teaching at her school, Hazelwood, for at least a third year. Um, and she aspires to stay in education long term. And this gets to our alumni leader. So it's our belief when we think about the human capital that's really required to help our students develop into the leaders that we know we can be, it's much more complicated than teachers. It really takes leadership at every single level. Many of our core members will stay in teaching, and teachers play an absolutely critical role. I think it's one of the hardest and most important jobs, to Sarah's point about having a caring adult in your life. But it also requires principals who can lead our, Baltimore, our 200 Baltimore City schools to really create an environment where teachers can excel and can thrive. It takes leadership at the district. Over here, these are four of our alumni leaders in um, Baltimore City. In the upper left is Bill Ferguson, who's a state senator. He believed that the best way that he could impact education was through state law. So as a 27-year-old um, young man just finishing the Corps, he actually ran against a 27-year incumbent and won and became on an education platform, became the youngest state senator in the history of Maryland. Next to him is Tina Hike Hubbard, who has been in Baltimore City for 18 years since she came here through Teach for America, is a member of the school board. Yasmin on the bottom, who um, is one of the co-chairs of the Baltimore Education Coalition, leading advocacy efforts like the school construction bill to impact students. And then Mark Martin, who leads Commodore John Rogers, which is, yay, <laughs> Commodore fans. <laughs> which is a school in East Baltimore, which when he began leading it a little over, well, I guess two and a half years ago, was the third lowest performing school in the state of Maryland. And he has brought together an incredible team of both new and veteran teachers, created a really strong culture, um, set a vision for 100% of the students, 100% of the time to be successful, and is really showing the power for human capital at every level to ensure that kids are, are put on a path to be successful. Um, so I did just want to want to close with sort of this very um, complicated, multifaceted uh, picture of how we're thinking about developing the human capital force in Baltimore City. We really believe that it is going to take the diverse leadership of everyone in this next generation at every single level le as teachers leading schools at the district and across the community building relationships and partnering with all of the assets that Baltimore already has to make sure that every single child is realizing his or her full potential. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jim Comer. I'm the professor of child psychiatry at the Yale Child Study Center, Yale University. Uh, my work has been uh, in schools in preventive psychiatry uh, starting in uh, 1968. Um, and uh, I uh, got involved in schools uh, in a almost accidental way, uh, but I have been concerned about and engaged in thinking about uh, building human capital uh, 
as the essential element for building equity uh, for all of my career, and it's because of my background, upbringing, uh, that that's the case. Uh, and I want to uh, tell you how that led into uh, uh, the work that I uh, do and what we've, the way we've designed it. Um, and I want to tell you about my background. Uh, my mother, uh, who had less than two years of any education, she worked as a domestic, uh, and my father had about six years of education, and he was a steel mill laborer. And the two of them uh, sent the five children to college for 13 college degrees. Uh, and while they were doing that, uh, I had three friends who were just as bright as anybody in my school, they were no different. Their parents had the same kind of education, same kind of jobs, and they were just as bright, and we were in the same school. And yet they all went on a downhill course. One died of alcoholism early, uh, mental health problems all of his life, the other, and the other was in jail a good part of his life. Because we were the same, when I came back to town planning to become a general practitioner of medicine, found that they were going downhill, I asked myself, why? We were no different. What, what, what happened? And that question uh, led me to become a volunteer while I was doing my service time in uh, poor communities, uh, eventually training uh, in public health psychiatry, child psychiatry, and the realization as I went through that, that the difference was that uh, my parents gave us a developmental experience that made it possible for us to uh, develop the human capital uh, necessary to be successful in school and in life. And then that led in turn for me to say, uh, why can't we do that in schools? Uh, because at that, but at the same time, that was about the 1960s and uh, so, and James Coleman, who was the leading soci so, uh, social uh, sociologist and uh, uh, thinker about education at the time, was saying uh, that poor kids lack social capital. Now, he didn't say it, but others took it in to mean that schools can't help poor kids. Uh, I believe that schools could help poor kids by providing the kind of experience in school that I received at home and that many may, middle and upper income children were receiving at home and even low income children who had parents and who were a part of the kind of home setting that I had. Uh, and we started with the uh, notion, well, one of the reasons that uh, our family worked for me, was that it was a well-functioning family. I came from a well-functioning church culture, uh, and there was a family uh, network of Fran and Ken who had high aspirations. They wanted to be successful. They wanted their children to be successful, and I was a part of that network. And it was possible within it to make attachments and bonding. <laughs> Probably my wife. <laughs> Can you, uh, turn that off? Thank you. I'm the one always saying turn your turn your uh, phones off. <laughs> uh, but we had the kind of uh, that uh, attachment and bonding that uh, made imitation, uh, in internalization, identification with the meaningful people and people around around me. Uh, possible. Congressman Cummings mentioned exposure. Uh, my family exposed me to everything educational possible, um, and, uh, they, and, and us as a family. Um, the uh, stimulating activities, everything that they thought would get us excited about uh, life even, and about education and learning, uh, we were a part of. And social skills we obtained as a part of all the activities we were engaged in. Um, the 
that allowed me to go to school and elicit from school people the kind of same kind of support that I received uh, at home, uh, I received at school. And that then made it possible for uh, me to grow, succeed in school, and to have a chance. Uh, at home, uh, there was the, uh, you learned, I and mean, we learned uh, all the skills and knowledge necessary to be successful uh, in school, uh, at both academic, uh, but also, and very importantly, the executive functions necessary to be successful in school and in life, how to plan, how to organize, how to manage, how to uh, focus, uh, uh, keep the difficult and troublesome impulses down. All of that was learned at home. Now, also, my mother, as a domestic, uh, had social, uh, social capital in that she worked for the uh, most successful people in the town. And so when we needed jobs later on, when we need whatever we needed, she always had people who were powerful who could tap into that network uh, and make it possible for us to have uh, the opportunities that uh, we needed. Uh, all of that uh, and all of that background uh, led me to believe that it ought to be possible to create schools wherever those schools are. The other thing that Coleman's argued and people around Coleman argued that the only way to deal with it was through integration, racial integration, integration of the schools. And so lots of effort went into that. But uh, as a result of that, the weakening of institutions that was mentioned there maybe hinted at in the previous, uh, by one of the previous speakers uh, also occurred. Uh, I argued that the problem was for poor children non-mainstream children was that they were underdeveloped and they had the different development, a development that made it possible for them to function well at home, on a playground, in a variety of other places, but not in school. And they couldn't elicit the support that they needed in school. And so we created a school, a nine element framework based on that theory. And that's what, again, what Congressman uh, Cummings talked about is that we ought to have a uh, theory and we ought to have a knowledge and understanding of the nature of the problem. Uh, and uh, we developed that uh, framework based on theory uh, of the importance of development and how development and learning are inextricably linked. And that if you promote the development of children, they will learn. Now, that's not, you can't mandate that. So what we had to do uh, was to create the framework that allowed the parents, teachers, administrators, uh, the custodians, and everybody else involved to create within the school building a culture of learning in which the same kind of attachment and, 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 and uh, 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 the belonging uh, that took place for me at home occurred for children in school. The same kind of imitation, identification, internalization took place in school. And then that allowed those adults to help those young people grow along critical developmental pathways. Uh, specific pathways, the social interaction, how to interact well with other people. Uh, Psycho-emotional, how to handle their emotions and feelings and um, moral ethical and linguistic and their intellectual cognitive and all of those, uh, again, with the notion that development, once they develop well, they can learn uh, well. Uh, and then created activities, a series of activities within the school, uh, the social skills curriculum for inner city children that we created, uh, in which um, they, they, they learn about politics and government, health and nutrition, spiritual leisure time activities, business and economic, uh, and they engaged in all of these activities, the same activities that mainstream children see their parents engaged in, that they're engaged in, we in built it into the school curriculum and integrated their development and learning uh, because they are inextricably linked. Um, the result of that was that those two schools that we started in, in New Haven, Connecticut, were, were 32nd and 33rd in achievement, were eventually tied for third and fourth highest levels of achievement in the city 
they went from having the worst attendance to having the best attendance in the city. Uh, and they went from having serious behavior problems all the time to having no serious behavior problems. Now, we've, we've done it a number of other times. A number of other people have done it a number of, of times. But somehow, somehow, we don't look at the theory and get a deep enough understanding of what children need. And there's too much politics among everybody, not just the politicians, the academicians, the researchers, um, entrepreneurs, and lots of other people that prevent us from focusing uh, with a laser beam uh, sharpness on development and learning and how it takes place and how all the adults and all of the institutions must be focused on promoting the conditions that make that possible. And so uh, the, the outcome, we're now trying to develop a partnership between uh, our program, uh, a university, uh, New Haven uh, School System, and Connecticut Department of Education, in which this will create a laboratory where we will look at pre-service teaching to deal with that problem of teacher dropout, uh, where from the beginning, teachers will learn about children, how they develop and learn, and how to apply those principles in the classroom, in the school, uh, and um, uh, uh, induction, uh, and on into uh, practice, that there will be a continuous look at and thinking about child development and the integration of child development and learning. We think that that can make a difference. Now, I think I, you know, I like to th think that we started with theory and we came up with something that has worked, it has worked in many places, but it's not new. Uh, when our program began to get attention, uh, I would go home uh, when I went to, me to speak about the program and my mother, who had no education, wanted to know, well, wh what is this everybody's interested in? Uh, tell me what you do. What is it you do? So I described how we try to help children gain the skills and the capacities by exposing them and, and helping them reflect on their experiences and giving them the social skills necessary to interact. And she looked at me because those were all of the things that she and my father, with very little education, gave us at home. And she said, but that's common sense. <laughs> and then she looked at me again and she said, and they pay you for that? <laughs> with that, I'll stop and take the question. <laughs> So I will start uh, off by asking a couple of questions and then we'll turn it over to the audience for questions. So my first question is more around the numbers. Um, so my husband, from the time he was 12 to the time he was 18, lived in what was essentially a crack house. A uh, number of things that happened in his parents' life led to um, them basically going from cornfield to crack house in a nine month period and he failed all of his classes his freshman year of high school and there was this incredible group of teachers who did everything from packed lunches, rides to school, um, tutoring, they made sure that um, it was easier to make good decisions and it fundamentally changed his life. One of the things I've always found really difficult to digest is the fact that his brother didn't have a group of teachers rally around him in the same way and their lives took drastically different paths and so my question to the panel is you know we have approximately 600,000 people in the city and approximately 80,000 students how do we mobilize enough people to actually ensure that every single child has a caring adult in their life Um, well, our approach is really uh, to start by looking at schools as a unit of change. So there are 85,000 students 
but there are 200 schools, which starts to make it feel like a much more manageable number. I was a teacher in New York City where there are 1,600 schools and 1.2 million students, and it just feels so vast. Whereas in Baltimore City, you can really start to, to map out, okay, if the most critical factor in a school, school building is in terms of the experience of the students during the day is the principal, you can start there. And finding 200 principals who can um, lead by effective management, creating a powerful culture, uh, investing all of the parents and students in a bigger mission and vision for what student achievement is gonna look like, that starts to become become manageable, and I, I do believe that our schools can often be the heart um, of our neighborhoods. I, I, I agree with that. Uh, I think the school is the unit of change, uh, and uh, while services and lots of activities and help and all those things, people who are interested, all of those are important, but, but you can have so many people involved that it becomes chaotic and confusing. Uh, it has to be organized and managed in some systematic way, but you also have to have enough organizers and enough managers at the heart of that relationship between the child and the adult, and, and that's in the school. Um, the, the, what we did, we started in school, in two schools, we eventually have been in a thousand schools across the country, uh, but it was the turnover of people, normal turnover even, that made me realize you can't do it this way. You can't just keep going around and trying to help people in the schools. The whole community and everybody has to eventually be involved but it has to be involved at the direction of the school or at the direction of the people on the front line delivering the service. That the, and that you have to create enough people who can do that. And that's why we're now trying to work with the School of Education, State Department of Education, to create a systematic, orderly way of creating those people who can then tell us who else could be and should be and how they can in be involved in a synchronous kind of way. Yeah, yeah I think it, it's, you, you've, the, the issue is scale. You know, we need so many caring adults that, you know, we can't wall off schools from the rest of the community. In fact, we should do just the opposite. We should think about, you know, schools within communities and focus as much on adult education and stabilizing the adult population within our communities as we, as, we as, as much time doing that as we spend on, on children. And, you know, in communities with, with low assets and, and human capital that's deteriorated, we, we really have to focus on everything from workforce development to adult education to drug treatment programs in order to get the volume of adults that are necessary to, to prog provide guidance to the next generation just not enough people in the schools uh, uh, in order to provide those relationships. So we have to mobilize the entire community. So theoretically, 600,000 people is enough people. It's just how are we going to mobilize 600,000 people? So I think one of the things that holds us back is our own brains. When we think about how uh, children make decisions as well as how adults make decisions, the brain looks at two things when it's trying to decide between two options. So one, it's going to look at what reward do I get if I choose A versus B. And it's going to look like, it's also going to look at if I'm looking at choice A and choice B, if I do the action, what is the likelihood I'll actually get the reward? So how believable is it? And I think one of the challenges we have is that if you're just, I remember there was a kid I was trying to convince to go to school one day and he just would not listen. I said, why would you not go to school? And he says, why does it matter? I'm going to end up dead or in jail anyway. Why waste my time going to school? And so, you know, it's a shocking statement, but what he was really saying was, if I can get 100 bucks for dealing drugs today, or if I have to wait seven years for going to high school and college to earn 300 bucks a day, and I don't even believe that I'm going to live seven years, why would I ever delay my gratification? And I think that also... Uh, kind of relates to why it can be challenging to get the community involved. So if the community believes that the kids are gonna end up dead or in jail anyway, then it's very difficult to mobilize people around 
around our children. So what are some of the things that you think we can do to really create data points and evidence for our kids and the community that, that there is opportunity for them? Um, it's interesting. One of my uh, favorite statistics um, about Teach for America is that 10% of incoming core members, if you polled them, would say that they're planning to stay in education long term, and then a full 72% end up spending their, so far, it's only 24 years in, have spent their careers in education since they finished their two-year commitment. And I believe that the reason for that is that regardless of the background of an incoming core member, whether they are um, people who formerly grew up in a low-income community and ended up being successful, or people who have never spent a lot of time in a public school, there is something about the leadership experience of working with students, falling in love with your students, experiencing some failure with your students and having to recover from that, and then ideally, if you are a successful teacher, discovering what's possible and the potential for your students that helps people want to be part of this. So I do think creating experiences, whether it's through training and supporting teachers, which is where we are spending our time and energy, or through bringing members of the community, th both those who are parents of the students and those who are um, beyond the school and not necessarily interacting with the school, into experiences where they can overcome challenges and realize what's possible is the most important thing. And then I also think at times there just needs to be a marketing campaign about the successes we're having. As someone who spends a lot of time talking to people about edu the educational landscape in Baltimore, and sometimes talking to people who don't have a lot of first-hand knowledge of what's going on in our schools, there really is a deficit of the positive stories across our city about the wonderful things our kids are doing, and I think we need to do a better job of telling those stories. Yeah, I, I think, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, this no. notion of learned helplessness is, is real, and it's not gonna go away very quickly. You know, the, the idea that over and over again, um, efforts not necessarily related to, to reward, uh, is entrenched in, in a lot of our children and, and some of the adults in our communities. Uh, we need to figure out ways to get positive role models who come from the community to stay. Uh, you know, many of our, part of our challenges is our most successful outcomes leave uh, and don't stick around to be models for the, for the next generation. And so, you know, that again requires us creating conditions, strong anchor schools, um, employment opportunities, um, housing conditions in the city that attract people uh, and, and require or, or motivate people to stay in the community and be good role models. Uh, if everyone who is a success story leaves, there aren't many things to point to uh, in for the next generation. Uh, Congressman Cummings gave the example of the student who was exposed to the possibilities who ended up in CNN. That exposure is what children from difficult backgrounds need and who have been limited to negative experiences within their communities. They need that kind of exposure. But you can't create programs like the one he described all over the place. But you can, in every schoolhouse, create a school experience that integrates the development and learning in a way that exposes children to, to the world. Yeah. So that in our program we had four units, one on politics and government, one on health and nutrition, spiritual leisure time, business and economics. And we built units in there that it allowed teachers, parents, uh, community leaders, uh, the mayor, got involved, all kinds of people got involved. The school was brought, the community was brought into the school and the school into the community. And we had uh, three things that we focused on, teaching them social skills, appreciation of the arts, and integration of basic skills and academic skills, and integrated them into those units. And that combination of exposure and a creation of particular skills at an early age, you know, fourth grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, kids were putting on shows and bringing people in and all kinds of activities that exposed them to the possibilities beyond 
what they would see walking to school. And you have to create very early that understanding that there is another world, there is another way, uh, and it doesn't become the choice of crack or going to school. You're, in an, you're having an exciting experience in and of itself. The problem, though, is that our program was all but destroyed by No Child Left Behind. And we've got to look at policy, and we've got to get the policy makers to understand child development and how you promote it and how it relates to academic learning and preparation for life. This focus on test scores and improving academics only is really very troublesome because most of the people I know who are very successful, well, okay, they did okay in school, but that's not what made it possible for them to be successful in life. And that's what we've got to get people to understand. All right, we'll go ahead and move uh, to questions from the audience uh, for Dr. Comer. Is there evidence to support the idea that poor and middle class students who attend mixed income schools have better outcomes? Uh, it, it, yes, there is, but it's not, it depends on where, where you are and what their particular experience, what, what the, re, the receiving school is like and, and a lot of factors. But there's also uh, evidence that if you can create a good environment, kids can learn anywhere and will learn anywhere and in any school setting. Uh, so, so that as a policy um, or strategy, uh, just concentrating on moving kids to higher income schools is not, is not the answer. You've gotta create good schools everywhere. Yeah, I think uh, there's clear evidence that uh, to the extent that mixed income creates mixed ability based on previous opportunities to, to learn that kids do better in mixed ability groupings uh, and that these mixed ability groupings need to be carefully kind of managed in order to get the right opportunities. There's also evidence that high performing students that are well prepared uh, don't suffer from uh, the exposure and in mixed income. In fact, you know, on some of the softer skills benefit from it uh, dramatically. Yeah. Okay, for anyone on the panel, uh, how do we keep highly qualified teachers at the most needy schools if the most needy schools get the least funding? I don't, it's not, it's not true across the country that the, the most, uh, uh, that the schools in, the, in our poorest neighborhoods get the least funding. That's true in some communities, it's not true in all, in all communities. Uh, many of the students, qualified teachers who are leaving, are leaving because of poor leadership in the schools or climate and culture within the schools, um, differential expectations of performance, um, and, and the fact that uh, performance, high performance is not always recognized and rewarded. Uh, and, and there's a number of factors that go into it beyond just the, um, the resources that the school has. In fact, in many of our urban areas, uh, we're seeing substantial resources um, that are comparable to our suburban districts without the return on, on retention uh, of highly qualified teachers. Just to support that point, the, uh in that first school, in the first two schools, we had one of those schools had went 13 years without having a single teacher turnover. And when you had the first one, it was for personal reasons, not because she did, wasn't having a good experience. So what gets created at the building level is so critically important. Right. All right, Ms. Cass, uh, what about continuity? Many Teach for America teachers leave after a few years and seem to be using the program as a resume booster for graduate school. Yeah, this is not the first time I've heard this question. Um, so I think the first, and um, Dean Andrews alluded to this, the first challenge is that in low-income communities, we struggle with teacher retention overall. So nationally, about 50% of all teachers leave after five years. Um, what we've seen in Baltimore, I described, it is often a transformative experience for our teachers. I told the story of Naomi. Um, a lot of our teachers come in not knowing if they're necessarily gonna stay in the classroom. Over the course of two years, Teach for America teachers have higher retention than other teachers in Baltimore City Public Schools, and that continues into three years. By five years out, while um, 
about 50% of all Baltimore City teachers are still there. We're about 10 percentage points lower. But what I would say, and it goes back to what I described about our theory of, of change, we believe that this problem is a lot more complicated than great teachers alone. It really requires leadership at every level and people who believe deeply in the potential of our students who are gonna impact the problem as principals, as school board members, as elected officials, as journalists, as doctors, and so on. So what we've seen that's really great about Baltimore is that it's very magnetic for our alumni. We have more than 600 Teach for America alumni still living and working in Baltimore. About 300 of them are teachers. About 170 of those teachers have been teaching for more than five years, so are veterans in the system. Um, but 12 of them are principals. 28 of them work at North Avenue. Many of them work in education nonprofits and are impacting our education system in ways that we believe are critical. I think if, if our goal were to retain 100% of our people in teaching, we would probably approach our recruitment and selection and human capital model in a very different way. I, since I brought up retention, I'd, I'd like to add to that that you know we shouldn't assume that we want to keep 100% of, of the teachers that go into the profession, whether they come from Teach for America or from the School of Education at Johns Hopkins University. You know, so some of this attrition is useful attrition, uh, and we should count on it. Uh, but we also know that years of service, you know, that th for the first three years of, of the teaching profession are challenging and difficult, and you get better at just the way you get better at anything uh, with practice and, 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 and years of uh, experience. So we need to address the, the retention issue is a complicated issue, and, you know, I would say we should advocate for retaining highly qualified and the best and the brightest and the most effective teachers not just celebrating teaching as a profession and assume that we should try to retain everyone. In fact, I think we should, we should do some selective um, uh, retainment uh, ourselves uh, and continue to focus on that. And schools of education or other places should um, be selective also. Absolutely. That a lot of people should go, should be counseled out of education before they ever get to. Uh, no argument here. <laughs> Uh, and I would say, uh, uh, by the way, Dr. Comer is one of my heroes for, for a long time. And, you know, his focus on getting teachers who really understand children and their development uh, is, is critical dimension. So as we're looking at who we want to keep in the profession, you know, we really need to, to make sure that we're keeping uh, teachers who are committed to and understand the development of children overall holistically. Yeah. Maybe we can broaden this question a bit and just, you know, Baltimore is a college town and has uh, a huge population of college students that come and are educated here and then often leave after graduation. Um, maybe we don't have to be as stringent with the criteria for retaining <laughs> people in general uh, as we would be with teachers. Are there ways that you know the schools or the community can play a role in retaining uh, those individuals to the city? Yeah, I think any way that we get them engaged in our communities and, and living um, close and within the within our communities. I mean, we have to focus on you know, strengthening the city in a way that uh, continues to attract young people to live here and, and be part of a vibrant community and get engaged in, in civic and, and social responsibility, uh, not just in education, but across the board, and the more engaged they are, they stay. I think to, to Teach for America's credit, we have a, a large number of of uh, city leaders and uh, community leaders who came out of the program and decided to stay uh, in Baltimore and came from different parts of the country uh, and stayed here because of the, the uh, experience and the engagement that, that they had with Teach for America. Okay, so this question is for anyone. It often seems like school administrations and policies constrain teachers' ability to work uh, at the top of their licenses. How can parents, teachers, and the community help address this issue? I'm not sure on the top of their I'm licenses. I'm assuming this means at the top of their licenses, like at the their teaching classes in which they are. Is the person who asked this question? Yeah. I mean, I think 
I think one of the first things that, that's critical here is people being really educated about the issues. I mean, there's so, so many of the issues, and even the premise of this question is, is like a lightning rod. I mean, you know, the <laughs> last in, first out, charter laws, no child left behind. It's, there are a lot of issues that are really incredibly hard to find consensus on, and in many cases, it creates a lot of national vitriol, um, pitting groups against one another, when ultimately a lot of the groups really want the same thing, which is to make sure that all of our kids are getting an excellent education. So I think that sometimes there can be a, a pretty false dichotomy, although there are certainly some policies that are better than others. Um, you know, I, I, so I would go back to education. I was just hearing um, Michael Lomax speak, and he was talking about uh, the United Negro College Fund did a survey of parents in low-income communities. And the parents said, by and large, um, parents said that they felt like the schools in their city or their community were not very strong. But I think it was 78% of the parents said that the school where they sent their own children was either excellent or pretty good, even though these were the same low-income schools in the same community. So I do think it's um, incumbent upon teachers and parents and others living and working in a community around the school to know what's going on at the school, where, where people are constrained, what are the things that may be holding kids or administrators or teachers back. I would also say as you look at it, uh, policies and, and administrative practices in large urban districts, you have to realize that these are uh, large, complex organizations with, that are running off of a certain business model and business plan. You know, and so, you know, policies get kind of generally distributed across the board, and for for many sub sub populations in certain schools, those policies seem absurd. Yeah. But it's you know they're they're constructed across a a, a large urban district. Part of the challenge of, of urban districts is just their pure size and, and inability to you know, to be nimble, the same way that large universities have the, the same kind of challenges, uh, cross-the-board policies that don't allow us to, to get our human capital kind of aligned with our, our greatest needs. So I think, you know, in, in some senses, and I'm not one to defend large urban districts and their, their administration, but they're very complex, large organizations that end up having sometimes what look to be, you know, absurd and counterproductive policies and, and practices. I agree. I agree with uh, that, and I've been thinking about how better practice can take place, um, and 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 to how you can remove it from uh, upstairs and bring it down closer to where the action is, so that there's something wrong, in my opinion, with the way. Uh, teachers teach, but they don't manage the system that they're in. And administrators are not, and teachers are not working together to manage the system that they're in. I don't know how many of you saw the the uh, doctor in the parade, uh, the um, in the uh, bombing, who had been in the marathon, mm -hmm. and he said he walked, he went from the marathon to the hospital to help. And he walked in and he could immediately tell what kind of uh, bomb had been used and what kind of, in, from the kind of injuries and so on. So what you had was a person with a training, with a knowledge base and skills that enabled him to immediately identify the problem and then he could begin to plan and think of uh, a way to address it. Now, that's what is needed in education, is that teachers and administrators need a kind of training and a knowledge base so that they can go in and adjust to whatever is there. And they can need the authority also to be able to make adjustments and changes that allow them to address problems uh, that they confront in real time. Uh, and that is a problem with the way we train teachers, and that's exactly what we're trying to look at in this partnership, is how you begin to train teachers differently uh, and provide them with the knowledge and skills necessary to be able to manage a system uh, so that it meets the needs of children 
all the time. And thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much to our three panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Very nice meeting okay. you too. So are you staying for the evening too? Thank you. Okay. Thank you all very much.